Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today, we'll be sitting down with one of our heroes of industry. We have with us today, Mr. Rob Munger from Cascade Tissue. He is a reliability engineer, and we are very excited to have him on with us to kind of talk through some things that are happening in his world, his journey to where he got, and, and things that he's looking at in the future. So, so welcome, Rob. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Looking forward to this conversation. So maybe to get us started for our listeners, you know, and a lot of our listeners, Rob, are, are people like you. They, we call them our heroes. They're, they're in the plants. They're working in manufacturing. They're making this country run. Uh, and we're so excited. So maybe walk us through your journey to the role that you're in right now, please. Okay. Yeah. So my journey is a little un- unconventional for this role. I served in the Army for 21 years, and when it was time for me to retire, I partnered with a veteran-friendly career placement agency and found an opportunity where I was looking to settle down here in Fort Bragg, North Carolina area. You know, with that, I tailored my resume, highlighting how I could bring value to the company based on the hard and soft skills I learned in life and in the service. I came down, I interviewed, I was picked up, started immediately after moving to North Carolina. And then I've been here for about 18 months and will say that it's exactly what I needed. Oddly enough, it was the military, I think, that set me up to be successful as a reliability engineer in manufacturing. Really? So, I mean, first of all, thank you for your service in the military. I mean, My that, pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. So when you, when you say that the military set you up for this industry, what what makes you say that? Um, I think it, it just brought a lot of the um, – it taught me a lot about networking, uh, communication, leadership, um, how to work, uh, autonomous. It taught me about budgets and supply trains and, you know, something that's very important in manufacturing, the safety aspect. Very, very true. Very true. And safety is something we've done some episodes on Eco Ask Why where, I mean, we, we really dig deep into safety. We did a whole episode on lockout tag out, which I'm sure you guys use at the plant there as well. I mean, so let's, oh, yeah. let, let's kind of talk a little bit more about industry and where things are going. You're, you're relatively new in your role, but you you're seeing a lot of things happening. And just so everyone knows, we're actually recording this in the middle of COVID-19 and, you know, things that are in our world are very different than they were, you know, a few months ago for sure. But for Rob, and we were talking about this before we start recording, you know, you guys make a, a pretty hot commodity right now with that toilet paper, man. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes. That's great. I mean, that's, that's, that's great. I mean, it's, it's good to hear plants that are, are up and running and, and, you know, are at full production. So, when you've seen some projects now and you've been involved with some things at your plant, what do you see as some of the greatest challenges that, that your industry has coming up over the next few years? Yeah, I'd say, um, you know, manufacturing as an industry will always struggle with how to become effectively streamlined, efficient, productive. You know, soon I think technology will bring a lot of these answers from remote sensing, data analysis, and prediction. But um, it's also the, the human interface, right? So the millwright and the electrician that utilize the technology. So I guess my answer would be that we need to embrace the requirement for an, like enduring mechanical and electrical professions so we can keep the industry running to provide commodities like you brought up and essential goods. Right, right. Now, are you seeing, you know, I've, we brought this up several times in the past too, where the personnel, the people who know how to keep this stuff running, they're retiring, you know, they're, they're, they're moving on into different aspects of their careers. Are you, have you seen that impact your industry at this point? Yeah. So that was something that, um, you know, I had experience with in the military. So, 
you know, people are always come and go in, in the military. It's, uh, you know, three years in at a duty station and you're, you're, you got orders to go to the next one. So you're constantly, um, as, as a soldier, you're do- constantly dealing with learning the culture of different places, almost like if you were jumping job to job every three years. But when you, when you do that or if you're there and, you know, somebody that you rely on, a superior or a subordinate, they leave, there's a lot, there's a, um, a learning curve um, where, you know, you have to backfill with either a different soldier or like in this aspect, another employee. And, and when we have the headcount that we do with uh, mechanics and, and uh, electricians, you know, that skill set, when you lose it, they retire, you know, you got to bring somebody up to speed right on their tail. So, yeah, and that can be challenging, no doubt, just so having that good training program or maybe an internship or some type of mentoring, you know, maybe that could be a way, you know, I, I just think about for my career, I have, you know, I've had one mentor in particular, but I think we all need that too, to help kind of guide us along that path, you know, of development, you know? Yeah, I think having um, a continuity program in place where you've got your standard operating procedures, you've got um, your center lines, you've got, you know, catalogs and of, of uh, all the parts that you have uh, in the equipment, in the storeroom. I think that's really pivotal. So that way when a new guy comes in or somebody gets bumped up to a higher position, you know, all they got to do is crack open the book and they can see wh- what the answer is. I know it's, you know, it's it's easier said than done sometimes, especially with the tempo of of the the company sometimes. But uh, if you can if you can do that, you set yourself up for success. I think. Right. Now, how do you guys use outside resources like distributors? I'm just curious. Is there a place in that world from, you know, process improvement and you know creating those procedures for outside help, or is that all? pretty much managed internally where where do you see that going yeah i think a lot of it comes down to um you know the the veteran guys that have been here for a while and have established that network and i think that's the big thing that um you know as a reliability engineer process engineer a technical engineer you need to you you might not come in with a a, you know full pockets full of um, business cards of who you can reach out to but you know, once you're in place and you got your feet on the ground, I think that's when you start reaching out. You um, you start looking towards building those networks of you know fabricators, of vendors, of you know different companies that might be able to point you in the direction of being able to you know get that solution that'll keep your downtime to a minimum. No doubt, that's what it's all about. You know, uptime. You know, when you when you spoke of resources, what are some resources that you use or that you found that have been pretty helpful in, in your role uh, up to this point? Well, I'll tell you, um, with my background that I, I brought up in the beginning, I didn't come here with, you know, expanse knowledge of, of manufacturing, especially in tissue, but I was I had good mentorship. I had a, a phone and, you know, an email, and I was able to reach out to the different uh, cascade plants around North America that have similar machines like we do and, you know, ask them for help, you know, being able to be directed into the direction of say a vendor and say, listen, we've got this component, you know, what do you have? What have you seen? What's compatible? Um, I think that goes a long ways. So, yeah, it's just it's networking. It's 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 knowing that there are people out there just like you that have run into the the same situation at some point. The code has been cracked, probably. So you just gotta you gotta find who's got that key, that nugget. That's right. So that's that's interesting. So you you can actually have a an internal network at Cascades that you go to for similar plants that have similar equipment, and you find out information that way yeah that's right okay there's actually um there's actually something that we have here at the plant you know uh it's called poca and for those that aren't aware poca it's an information sharing app 
built you know specifically around manufacturing so think of it as a communication troubleshooting and training tool specifically designed for your plant so if you know how to navigate facebook poca is just as intuitive i mean it's amazing the things you can do to share knowledge across your company so you know here it's accessible on an ipad or an iphone and um you know what we do is we build content uh, we build training videos right there on our lines using our equipment and our employees. Um, so that way, you know, if, if a new employee comes in, needs to know how to do something on the machine, all they got to do is just type in a search word. If we've made the video or if we've covered it in a, in a post or a troubleshoot, it comes up, they look at it, and, you know, most of the time the answer is there. What that helps out, is that way that that employee that's on call doesn't get a phone call at two in the morning on a Saturday because a line is broken and nobody has the answer. So if, if we're lucky enough to actually have seen the, the problem and made content, it's already there for the operator to access. Man, that is super cool. So you said that's called POCA? Yeah, P-O-K-A. And your company will have to buy into a license. Um, there's, you know, there's a little bit of a learning curve, but like I said, it's it's pretty intuitive. Like it's just like Facebook. I mean, you can post pictures, you can post videos, you can post, you know, documentation. It's it's great. That is cool. So I'm just curious because we're we're starting some to create some videos, and that's that's something that's new in my wheelhouse right now. So it's taking a lot of my mind share, and I'm I'm having a lot of fun with it, but. When you say make the videos, are you just making them right with your like a cell phone and, and uploading it there? Yeah, so you can use um, you know some different editing software. You you got to figure out what you want to use and, and have have that as your standard. And then when you start uh, videoing it, you can use different apps or you can just use the regular you know video on your, your iPhone or Android, and then you just upload that video to the Polka app, maybe after you've done some editing or some voiceover, splashed in a couple of graphics or something. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a game changer. No doubt, man. I'm just, and last thing on this topic, when you said there, there's different apps, what do you prefer to use with that video editing? So what I've uh, looked into is Movie Maker. Um, it's it's available on the Apple App Store, and the reason why I went that route is because in our environment it's very loud. And so what we ended up doing after a couple of videos that we just weren't getting the the audio quality where we needed it, we bought a, a Bluetooth headset. This app would accept that hardware, and then. All you do is you have your operator put the headset on, you go live, you capture the video, and it's crystal clear. So when, when you're done editing, you know, and, and we've got a, a very talented person that puts the videos together, it, she's amazing. You know, her voice is great. Uh, she knows how to do all the whiz-bang stuff. And uh, I don't know if you can tell in my voice, but it's, it's exciting. <laughs> I love it. I can tell, man, you got really pumped up about that. And that's great. I mean, and, that, and that's what we're yeah. trying to do with this podcast is share ideas, you know, that, that people like you, man, if, you, if you're if you finding value, I guarantee you somebody's listening to this podcast will find value in it. So that yeah, was you that, bet. that was great, man. I mean, so man, let's, let's kind of shift a little bit. Let's talk about some goals. I mean, everybody, you know, things are happening right now in our, in our country, in our world. Obviously, it's not the same environment that we were living in, you know, last quarter by any means, but I'm sure some goals maybe have, have changed or shifted. You you said you guys are running wide open, which is wonderful to hear. What would be some of the goals for the year and, and, and how have they changed or how are you tracking to them? Just curious on, on what's in front of you. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I was just talking to the, uh, the production manager about this this morning. You know, we are a 24 seven operation and as far as goals at the plant, we are in the middle of an enormous expansion. It's an exciting time for the company. And I think as we finish setting up the last of the production lines and increase our headcount for our maintenance section, 
you know, my focus in the reliability realm is to get to know the, the personalities of the new machines. I think every machine out on our floor, they've got their own personalities. Okay, so, you know, I'm going to take a, a hard look to ensure the center lines are established and identify what the picture of reliability looks for each machine. And then, you know, lastly, I think validating all the preventive maintenance routes and getting a coherent schedule together, that's, that's going to be, you know, the, the icing on the cake. I'm on track with, you know, validating all those new routes, and we're tripling our hardware and output, so we're on the clock to maintain our new investments as soon as we turn the power on. Right. And maybe let's, let's walk through, you know, some of our listeners, man, they're still, you know, developing their careers. They haven't had a chance like you have where, you know, you, you've really come in at a great time. You're getting to learn a lot about the expansion and new equipment. And a lot of times, you know, that stuff's already there and our, you don't have that chance to, to be there at the beginning. So when, so let's just kind of take this chance, this opportunity, if you will, to walk us, walk our listeners through it. When you say establish a center line or route development, can you kind of go a little bit further there in, in an explanation, if you will? Yeah. So as we're getting in this uh, new hardware, and it's you know it's coming from overseas, we've sent teams over there to do checkouts and make sure that everything was good before they disassembled it, put it in boxes, and brought it over here. You know that that machine doesn't come to us with established center lines. Like they have no idea what our our products are going to be, and and so it's up to us to. Um, you know, take our our materials, our resources, throw them on the machine once it's all built up, ready to be turned on, and and really get that good center line of of what efficiency and availability to meet quality to really be able to make that that machine run efficiently, and then you know pump out the best product that we can. Right, and then so. You know, to, to maintain that, you know, like I said, uh, manufacturing as an industry, it's always going to struggle to to stay efficient and productive. So, you know, we have we have the keys to brand new Ferraris sitting out on our our production line. I mean, they are brand new, beautiful machines, and and for us to maintain them, you know, we we get the uh, preventive maintenance routes built from a team up in Canada that comes down from headquarters. Uh, they come through, they physically go through these machines, they take pictures, um, they, they dig in the books, the manuals, and then they build these routes and they send them down to us. And then we go out there, we validate, make sure that it all makes sense. You know, it, it passes the, the common sense test. And then, uh, you know, we send it back, we say, hey, it's good to go, or maybe edit this. And then we see that get dropped into our schedule. And so, you know, we're tripling our, you know, machines. So it's going to be, it's going to be crazy time come, you know, another couple months once we have everything up and running, our millwrights, our electricians are really going to have their hands full. But, you know, we've got that on the job training time right now where, you know, people are getting familiar with the bits and pieces. So I think we're going to be okay. Right, right. And it sounds like this project, just from hearing it in your voice, this is something that you you're you're pretty excited about. Am I right? Oh, I'm I'm passionate about it. Like I, like you said, I was brought on to um, you know be part of the the maintenance team as a reliability engineer. But you know, right in the middle of it, it's it's you know you hit the ground and it's like okay, um, a month goes by, another month goes by, and then all of a sudden, all right, we're starting to see our first machines come in, rearranging the floor, you know, and it's just, it's, it's really cool. That is cool. That is cool. So, I mean, from a, from a reliability engineer standpoint, maybe let's just walk that for our listeners who, who, who may be, you know, considering a, a career like yours, what is a day in the life of the reliability engineer, man? I mean, what, what are you doing? Well, it's it's crazy because, you know, this company here, they, they hadn't had an actual reliability engineer in this plant. So they always had somebody that was filling the role, but then they kind of got used over in this role and used over here. Reliability 
really kind of got pushed off and it's important it's an important role when it's being utilized right and you have somebody dedicated to do it so you know a week in the life would be you know come in look at what machines have you know made boo-boos over the weekend or something or you know created some downtime and and you start peeling back the onion you're looking at you know why did this happen the root cause analysis you're looking back on the, on the OEE for the weekend or maybe in the past and you're really trying to kind of connect the dots to see what is it about either the material that we're running the speeds that we're running you know environmental issues is it the team that's running it the different shifts and you really have to kind of piece it together and come up with a, a, an answer to be able to feed to upper management and your maintenance team to say, okay, this is what I see, and here are my recommendations on how to get ahead of it. Right. So you're kind of that uh, that detective, right, going in behind after. Yeah, and, yeah. Right. there you go. So do you, mm-hmm. do you have a lot of fun doing that? Yeah, I really do. And, I mean, it, it you know, it. After I've been put in charge of a project or asked to conduct analysis, working through that data, the design, the concept, even the procurement, the implementation, once you get to see the results of maybe a project that you're in charge of or being able to show the data of where you're maybe losing out on production because of the machine, you know, it's very rewarding. You know, it took me a second to know that this job was the right fit for me after leaving the military. But, you know, after my first project was complete and I un- kind of understood the importance of the OEE and the KPIs, man, I was hooked. Really? I mean, so yeah. from a fulfillment standpoint, I mean, everybody's searching for, you know, what what brings that joy of their day, right? Because hopefully we're not just getting up to go to work just to go to work. I mean, we'll, we want to find some purpose in what we're doing. Where, where do you get that fulfillment at, man? You know, I think it's uh, what gets me excited is anything dealing with like predictability or or even remote sensing technologies. I know they're out there. They're expensive sometimes, but if the company is willing to make the investment, you know, I think it's it's great to be able to get ahead of things. And that's where I like to be. That's where I, I like to have the answer for the boss of this is what I'm seeing and we need to be prepared. You know, and that that brings a lot of trust and credibility um, to him about me, and and you know, it's it's a good place to be. No doubt, no doubt. I mean, sounds like you're driven by the right things, man. That's great. You know, and it's yeah. there may be that reliability on engineer or or that that young engineer in college too that's thinking about coming to industry, and they're maybe they're straddling, trying to figure out where they want to go. What's some advice you would like to offer them up? If, if somebody's thinking about uh, making that jump into the world we're in? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, know what you want to do. Know your worth. Have some experience at looking at things not as they are, but how they could be, and then build your network. And, you know, it's it, in my industry, I'd say it's it's great to be a reliability engineer right now in the in the time that we're in. Um, cause I'm considered essential personnel. So, you know, try and try and look towards those avenues, those opportunities where, you know, when things like this happen, we, we, we couldn't predict, you know, COVID, but it, for me, luckily for me and my family, luckily, you know, essential personnel, we got to make the, got to make the tissue, you got to make a, everything, you know, to go along with that. So it's, I guess the advice would be, um, just kind of know what you want to do, but also be very flexible right. because you do have to be flexible in this job because things are going to break. You know, you, you got to have the patience and you got to have the the will and determination to get that thing fixed as soon as you can get production back online. Right. Sounds like there's no, that's gotta, no two days the same either, right? Right. That's got to be a driving force is that, you know, you want to get things fixed now so that way, 
you know, the company is, is seeing profits and they're seeing, you know, greater things. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and when people think of reliability engineers and, and just engineers in general, there's preconceived notions that come to mind, right? And, and one question I love to always go to is if you, if you could have a chance to debunk one myth about reliability engineers, what would that be? Because you may have had a diff- certain preconceptions, you know, when you were in the military, you know, before you came to this. And, and now that you've been in the role for a while, you know, what, what, what's out there that, you, that you'd like to take the chance to say, nah, this is not really the way it is? <laughs> yeah, I would say um, I didn't know how I was going to be perceived when I came on board. But I would say that, uh, you know, not all reliability process technical engineers are the same. You know, we do not all fit into the same one-size-fits-all cookie-cutter description. I think, you know, depending on the different industries, you'll see male and female, young and old, clean-cut and or tatted-up engineer folks. It's crazy. Like the saying goes, don't base a book on its cover. Different countries and industries bring different flavors. And I just, I love to see a, a diverse group of like-minded get the job done superstars out there man that was awesome that was that is what it's all about right here man i mean that's what and that's what this podcast is all about you just summed it up right there i mean it's, that's so great <laughs> i mean and think about maybe something that's happened in your career that would be a, a highlight if you want to look back it could be from your military days or 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 a cascade or any other role just curious on what would, what a highlight would be right now and i'm sure you'll have many more to come in the future but is there anything you'd like to share with our listeners i'll, t- I'll tell you what I've, i'm new to this game right now so i would say that this is this right here is a huge honor and highlight just being asked to share my experiences on a podcast that'll be heard around the world to millions of followers chris well, man, that's that's awesome, man. I mean, I, I feel very honored that you would say that. I mean, we feel honored to have uh, you know someone like you be able to join us. So, just, so thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. It's been it's it's so great. Oh man, and, and it's uh, it, it's getting fun. That's for sure. We're and we're having we're learning, and <laughs> I, I think I'm just thinking about our the listeners, the people that hopefully will will follow us and give us comments and feedback on, you know, they're hearing your story and there's somebody now that's smiling and nodding their head and saying, I want to be that guy. You know, I, I want to, be, I hope so. Yeah. You know, I mean, really, it, it's, it's really cool yeah. when you think about it. So, and, you know, maybe we'll shift here and talk a little bit about you outside of Cascades, man. Um, maybe, okay. maybe give us a, a little bit of idea of, of who Rob is uh, away from work. You got any hobbies that you'd like to share? Oh my God. Yeah. So, you know, my life has been full of hobbies. I have a garage and a shed to prove it. (laughs) Um, I'm an outdoorsy kind of guy. So anything that gets me outdoors on the weekends or after work, you know, I've dabbled in it. Uh, Recently, I bought a motorcycle, North Carolina. The the weather's really good almost year round. So watched a few YouTube videos and, you know, I feel like I could take on the Moto GP circuit. So <laughs> nice. Um, now what kind of bike did you yeah. get? Well, you know, I got I got a little uh uh Ninja 300 for now, but I got my my eyes on a bigger and better obviously, but okay. you know, it's it's fun. Um you know, and I I like being able to jump on the bike in the morning. Um it, it definitely wakes you up. It gets you into work um with some vigor. Because you know it's it's a lot different than just easing back in your your car seat with a cup of coffee. Like you're switched on when you're on a bike. So yeah, no doubt. Um, yeah, I asked you that question because I'm a motorcycle guy, man. Myself, now I'm I'm not the uh, the speed demon that it sounds like you are. Um, more of a okay. more of a Harley guy. But you're right. Okay. North Carolina. You know, I don't have I, I have a little Sportster now, but uh, with with it seems like since you start having kids and you know, I got another That's baby right. on another baby on the way. There's just, uh, you know, it's just hard to find time to get on a bike. But it's something. You're right. When you're on a bike, you are switched on. And the one, I'm not sure if you're not from North Carolina, are you? 
No, I'm kind of from all over the place. Um, I originally started uh, riding. My first bike was a Harley, and that was in Colorado. Okay. So, yeah. Well, well, you'll have to go out, man. On if you got the uh, the ninja there, and as you move up, you know, with your with your bikes, definitely hit up if you haven't yet the tail of the dragon. Uh, that is worth the, the trip out in western part of North Carolina. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's I'm not sure if you're familiar with that road or not. but uh, Chris, I was just looking that up on Google Maps today at lunch, talking to some friends about going out there this summer. It's, it's 11 miles. It's 300 turns. Yeah, and there's a tree of shame at the end apparently where you yep. you bolt your broken fairings and all that stuff quick story for our listeners so the first time i ever rode to tail the dragon i was with my dad i was about 17 it was one of those trips man uh we just did a weekend trip actually and just it was just me and him uh he had a, a heritage soft tail i had a little sportster and we rode for two days straight so anyway we ended up at the dragon and we didn't know we at the at the very end, there's a little motorcycle resort, like a it's like a gas station. But it's, it's for those who've been there, oh, yeah, yeah. you, you kind of know what I'm talking about. So we we get to this to this part of the ride, and we get off the bikes like that was one crooked doggone road. So we go inside, and we're like, they're selling t-shirts, and my me and my <laughs> me and my dad were like, uh, what are these t-shirts for? And they're, they're guys like you do realize you just road one of the most famous roads in america right and we're like what and uh so we so we stumbled upon it and then you know since then we rode it you know multiple times i've even done it on a vehicle before and i mean if when you go they used to have like uh professional photographers in certain corners with banners up and and you could go to their website at the end of the day and you know buy your picture of you you know, riding the dragons, but it, you have a lot of fun if you can make that trip, man. Oh, I'm going to be out there this summer. Nice. I, I might not be back, <laughs> but I'll be out there this summer. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. <laughs> so what other hobbies you got, man? Uh, that's kind of it. You know, um, when I, when I get home, I do like to take care of the house. Um, I like to take the dog out for a walk. You know, I just, I'm getting older these days and I'm really starting to kind of uh, ease it back other than this, you know, motorcycle uh, bug that I caught, you know, I'm I'm really starting to just enjoy life, enjoy the, the backyard. And it's, it's great. That's great, man. That's great. So maybe share with us some things that you're curious about right now. What's, what's driving your curiosity? Which, what are you studying? Things like that. Well, you know, now that I'm a, uh, official engineer, uh, by trade, uh, with 18 months under my belt, um, <laughs> you know, expanding more on, on the YouTube videos, I've subs- subscribed to the, uh, the Kawasaki racing team page. And, you know, I'm so inspired by the guys behind the bike. I mean, the rider and the tech team that make it all happen. It's gotta be an exciting job to travel and build a bike specifically to win a world championship, knowing you know, that that technology that they perfected will one day see its way to a showroom floor for a guy like me to buy and enjoy as a hobby. So, you know, really kind of diving into this engineering world and seeing that, you know, bits and pieces of data and, and testing this and analysis there. And it's really changed my mindset. And it's it's really kind of hit that reset button for me, kind of what I was talking about with you know my transition from the military to civilian world, it's not easy for us mill guys that are retiring out or getting out. It, it, life is so different, and you just kind of need that time, and you you need something to get into um, to help you make that change. And and I think in the past year and a half, you know, really getting into the machines here at work, and then now I'm starting to see that I'm very interested in on my own time so Mm -hmm. it's 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 quite a change um but i like it right right so you're using you said youtube and different different forums for the the racing learning about how how those that team does you know advances in technology and things like that is that correct 
Yeah, that's right. So it's something about me. Like once I get into a hobby and something captivates me, like I'm full in, like I'm diving deep, you know? So unfortunately, you know, the pocketbook feels the effects of that, but it does a lot of times it points my focus in the right direction. Right. It, it keeps, it keeps me safe. It keeps me, you know, on track on that learning curve and I'm not stagnant. Right. So, so yeah. To, to stay, you, you brought up the, the, your pocketbook keeps you, keeps you on a certain track and I, I'm, I'm with you there, but I, I thought about this, <laughs> thought about this question today, actually, man. And, and I think it's a fitting one for, for right now. So if you, if you had the extra money, you know, be it your personal budget or budget it at Cascades and you could spend it on anything right now, what would that be and why? You know, I think I'll just stay in, in, in the work realm here. Um, there are so many new crazy technologies out there. There's, there's goggles that you can put on, walk around your production floor and it's like a heads up display and things will pop up and it says, you know, check the temperature here or maintenance route right here. And, you know, if, if I, I could have the pocketbook for a day, man, I would write the check immediately, buy into all of this crazy technology and just see how far we could push it. Cause I mean, if it's out there, Man, I'd have holograms and and all sorts of whiz bang stuff on this production floor. It would be, it'd be bananas. I'm gonna tell you, man, it's not far out, Bo. I mean, it's coming. It, it, aug- augmented reality, and 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 yeah. we've been, we've seen a few suppliers, you know, come by Eco and show us this stuff. And you know, I get to thinking about okay, you know, from a maintenance standpoint, you know, if you you can. To so it it's coming to the floor. It's already on the plant floor, you know, in certain industries. But uh, I, I'm with you, man. I mean, there's so many cool things that are out there that are coming that uh, that are that are already here. The whole the industry 4.0 and uh, you know smart manufacturing and the IIoT and all these things. I mean, it's it's here and it's going to be fun. It's going to be a fun industry to be in for for a long time. So. Uh, I'm, yeah, we're here and we get to experience it. That's what's cool about it. Isn't that cool, man? That, that's, yeah, it is cool. That's really that's a lot of fun. So I mean, maybe uh, let's let's. I got one more question, okay? And Shoot. and sometimes this one, yeah, I've I've used this in the past and it it kind of throws people a little bit. But if you could step into my shoes right now, what would you have asked yourself that I haven't? I would say, um, you know, what's one of your biggest failures, um, even for me so far, and what did what would you learn from it, and how is it making you go farther or making you better? Well, let's go there. Okay, um, I'd say, you know, when I first got to the job, I did not completely understand the nuances of the civilian work environment versus where I'd been for over 20 years, you know, serving in the military during conflict or conflicts. So there was a steep learning curve on how we do things out here compared to the, you know, high tempo, get out of the way and ask questions later, lifestyle of the military. So not everything out here is life or death. And it was definitely a transition. And I would just say that, you know, there's probably no better place for me to personally have gone through that transition than than right here and i'm truly blessed to have this job and i guess the one piece of advice i would give is to any recruiters or hr reps that are out there maybe listening to this you would do yourself and your company a huge service if you cast your net into the retiring military pool for some really strong diverse candidates. They may not all be, you know, winners, but we bring a lot of different skill sets. And I think, you know, it was very gracious of, you know, my immediate boss to to interview me, look at my my strengths and my weaknesses and say, hey, you know what, I still want this guy for the team, 
and giving the nod to the HR rep and saying, I, I want them, bring them in. And, you know, that that manager, Mr. Ron Quick here at, at Cascades, I mean, he patiently helped me put into focus the strengths that I brought and then how to work on the weakness. And, um, you know, that's, that's one of the biggest things is, um, you know, I, I learned from my failures. I moved on. Like I said, you know, I, I stepped on a few toes here and there, but um, it was I was in a, 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 tr a time of transition. People understood that. They stood behind me, and now I'm here. I'm on a podcast. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Absolutely, man. I mean, I'm so glad you said that, too, because, you know, Eco, I, we used to have a motor service division. I'll tell you from personal experience, some of the best – hands down workers technicians reliable we even had reliability engineers that worked for that worked for us and they would go out and do the a lot of the service work they were you know uh they had a military background and okay. our operations manager you know when i put him in that role he was uh he wasn't confident in himself and i remember telling him i said stanley i believe in you and your training your military training you can lead this group of men, no doubt about it. And you know what? I mean, he performed, you know, just flawlessly, man. I mean, he he led the team, and and just so much of that military training, you know, came out day in day out, and 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 ha and his leadership style, and uh, he just it was great. And we had so many, you know, Mike Rathman. You know, he's, you've met with Mike, and he's been on this the podcast. You know, he, he ex Navy. So when I open it up and, and thank you for our service, I I'm really, I truly mean that from the bottom of my heart, and and uh, and I am so glad you mentioned that because that is something that uh, it's a great pool of talent out there, uh, and if they serve the flag, I think we should support them. So so thank you for for yes, for, for going there, Rob, and maybe let's wrap my up with, with with one more question if 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 you got time, I'd like yeah I've got it. I like to, uh, we call it Eco Ask Why, and I, I like, like, like to, we named it that for a reason. We really want to get to the why, I mean, of, of, because that gets to purpose and what drives people. So, so why do you enjoy the role you're in and the career path that you're on? Yeah, um, I think it, it really comes down to, it comes down to family, to be honest. Um, this is, this is really the first place. Uh, I think in, in my entire career where I felt like a family, we're, we're about a, probably a 200 head count uh, plant here. It's definitely not like the, the military or anything. It's a little bit more close knit. I know people's first names here. And, you know, I think it, it really just comes down to, it's easy to approach any of my teammates here to help me understand the bigger picture, you know, either in maintenance or production. Um, I can talk to the supervisors, finance, quality, the logistic managers, and really get the big picture. It helps me understand, you know, what I'm doing every day and why it's important. Right, right. Sounds like you got a great environment there, man, and, and sounds like just a great culture as well of – that you yeah. that you're surrounded by. Yeah, it, it really is. That's wonderful. Well, I, I really I can't thank you enough, Rob. This has been one of my my favorite episodes. I can promise you that of of walking <laughs> walking through your story and and I think you've been, you've inspired. I know you've inspired some people. You've probably made some people smile with you know they they face some of the things you're facing. And I just want to just just thank you again. Uh, I know you brought just a ton of value to our listeners and I've really enjoyed this conversation. So thank you, Rob. Well, that's great. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Adam. You know, I just, I want to say thank you for the opportunity today. Um, I'm honored to do this. I'm a huge fan of podcasts. I listen to them all the time, driving into work or doing yard work. Um, I, and I've learned a lot from your team too. So, you know, the, the back and forth, um, it's been, it's been great. And, um, yeah, just but, keep on doing what you're doing. This is this is what the community needs. So that's that's why I'm really happy to be here. Well, again, I appreciate it. And, and you know, we were talking before. So if if, if toilet paper supply keeps running low up here, I may have to come see you, man. I'm just saying, you know. 
Hey, I got I, I got you covered. You want one or two ply? <laughs> two ply, man. Nothing but the best for me and my wife, you know. All right. You're one of those soft guys, soft that, guys. That's right. Well, I live with a house full of women, so one ply is not gonna fly here, you know. <laughs> that's true, and it goes really fast. <laughs> that's right. Well, thank you again. I really enjoyed it, buddy. All right. Thanks a lot, Chris. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com. 